In the last video, we have qualitatively defined what it means for a vehicle to be understeering or oversteering. In this video, we'll define a quantitative measure for the understeering or oversteering of a vehicle. This measure will be called the understeer gradient. In particular, it makes intuitive sense that the understeer or oversteer behavior of a vehicle changes with its lateral acceleration. So for example, imagine a vehicle that's driving at a very small lateral acceleration, meaning that it is driving at a low speed or it's driving on a track that has a very large radius. Since the lateral acceleration is small, this means the slip angles of the front and the rear wheels are small and hence the vehicle is almost neutrally steering. On the other hand, if the lateral acceleration of a vehicle increases, then also the slip angles of both tires have to grow and hence the understeer or oversteer behavior of this vehicle will become more prominent. Now the understeer gradient quantifies the rate of change of a vehicle's understeer or oversteer if the gradient is negative with its lateral acceleration. In the rest of this video, we'll make this definition more precise and derive a specific mathematical expression for it. To this end, let's look at the stationarity conditions during a steady state cornering maneuver. This diagram shows the geometry of the dynamic bicycle model, which is drawn in white. We can see the local velocity vectors at the front wheel and the rear wheel with the corresponding slip angles and the resulting instantaneous center of rotation O and the center of gravity of this model abbreviated with COG is this point here. The assumptions we'll make in the following are first of all the assumptions of the dynamic bicycle model. So in case you want to make sure what these assumptions are, please watch the corresponding video. In particular, one assumption is essential, namely the steering angle delta of the front wheel is small. As a consequence, the two lateral tire forces at the front wheel and at the rear wheel can be assumed to be perpendicular to the vehicle's orientation. Since these two forces, FF and FR, are the only forces acting on the vehicle, this actually completes the free body diagram of our dynamic bicycle model. The second main assumption is that the dynamic bicycle model is in a steady state cornering maneuver for which we have derived this equation in our video on oversteer and understeer. For reasons of notational simplicity, we'll just denote the steering angle of the dynamic bicycle model by delta in the following. The third main assumption is a linear tire model, which means that our dynamic bicycle model is actually a linear bicycle model. So we have that the front tire force is equal to the cornering stiffness of the front tire times the front tire slip angle. And the rear tire force is equal to the cornering stiffness of the rear tire times the slip angle of the rear tire. The fourth main assumption that we'll make is that the cornering stiffness coefficients C alpha F and C alpha R depend linearly on the vertical tire load of the respective tire. In other words, the cornering stiffness coefficients of the front wheel and the rear wheel are given by some proportional factors times the corresponding vertical force on the tire. The proportional factors are here denoted with C tilde alpha F and C tilde alpha R for the front and the rear wheel respectively. 
the vertical tire loads FZF and FZR can be visualized from another free body diagram of the dynamic bicycle model from a sidewards perspective. So they represent the vertical tire forces acting on the front and the rear tire. Of course, these two forces compensate for the weight of the vehicle, which equals to the mass of the vehicle times the gravitational constant. And by definition, the force mg has the center of gravity as its point of attack. Now let's set up the static equilibrium conditions for this free body diagram. First of all, the balance of forces in the z-direction yields that FCF plus FZR must equal to mg. And second of all, the balance of moments about the center of gravity yields that LR FZR minus LF FZF must equal to zero. Solving these two equations for the vertical tire forces yields that FZF is equal to LR divided by L times mg and FZR is equal to LF divided by L times mg. Now we define these dimensionless quantities as WF and WR and what they represent of course is the fraction of weight on the front and rear tire respectively. So this finishes our statement of assumptions that we'll use in the following. Next, we'll state the dynamic conditions that must be satisfied for the stationary rotation of the dynamic bicycle model about the center of rotation O. For this, we will make use of the free body diagram that we have drawn in the upper left-hand corner. Let's begin by introducing a polar coordinate system in the instantaneous center of rotation with a radial coordinate direction and an angular coordinate direction. By using the center of gravity principle, we can then state the following balance of forces in the radial direction namely the mass times the radial acceleration equals to the sum of all forces pointing in the radial direction. And if we look at the free body diagram, there are actually two forces which point exactly against the radial direction. So they enter the equation with a minus, minus FF, minus FR. As the vehicle is driving with a constant longitudinal velocity and also with a constant radius r around the point O, its acceleration in the radial direction equals to the centripetal acceleration, which in turn is equal to minus the longitudinal velocity squared divided by the radius r. Similarly, we can derive another equation from the balance of moments, which we get from the angular momentum principle about the vehicle's center of gravity. What we get from this is the angular mass times the yaw acceleration equals to the sum of all moments about the vehicle's center of gravity, which is the moment of the force FF given by this expression and the moment of the force FR given by this expression, where the sign of this moment here is negative because the rear tire force rotates about the center of gravity in clockwise direction, whereas the front tire force rotates in counterclockwise direction. Again, we impose our condition for the stationary rotation of the bicycle model about the center of rotation O, which in this case means that the yaw acceleration has to be zero. So now we have two equations that we call one and two for the two unknowns, which are the front tire force and the rear tire force. And if we solve one and two for the two tire forces, we get this expression 
for the front tire force and this expression for the rear tire force, where we recognize this term as WF and this term as WR. Note that the two tire forces that we have just computed are exactly the tire forces that are required to keep the vehicle on a stationary circle about the center of rotation. And now we may substitute these required tire forces into our linear tire models. So we solve for the required slip angles that must be satisfied in order to keep the vehicle on the stationary circle. And they're given by one over the cornering stiffness coefficient of the corresponding tire times the tire force. And if we substitute the expressions from up here, what we get is this expression for the front tire slip angle and this expression for the rear tire slip angle. These expressions for the slip angles can now be used in the steady state cornering condition that we've stated at the beginning. So plugging this expression into here and this expression into here and taking out the common factor v ln squared divided by r, we get this expression for the steady state steering angle delta. If we stare at this expression for a little bit, we realize that the dynamic steering angle is given as the kinematic steering angle plus a correction term that depends on the longitudinal speed of the vehicle. Furthermore, we observe that if this factor in the brackets is positive, then the steering angle will increase with the longitudinal speed. And if this factor in the brackets is negative, the steering angle will decrease with the longitudinal speed. But that's exactly what we have defined as understeer and oversteer in the previous video. So if the steering angle increases with the longitudinal speed, we have an understeering behavior of the vehicle. And if the steering angle decreases with the longitudinal speed, we have an oversteering of the vehicle. And that's precisely the reason for defining this term as the understeer gradient of the vehicle. And we'll use the capital letter K to denote this understeer gradient. And looking again at the entire formula, what the understeer gradient tells us is how the dynamic steering angle delta has to change with the longitudinal speed in order to keep the vehicle on a circle with a given radius. Or to be a little more precise, we may realize that this expression here is exactly equal to the lateral acceleration of the vehicle that's associated with driving on the circle with radius r. So the dynamic steering angle delta is an affine function of the lateral acceleration and the linear factor is exactly equal to the understeer gradient. In the last part of this video, we'll illustrate the definition of the understeer gradient and we'll also use this illustration to define what's called the characteristic speed and the critical speed. So let's begin with a graphical illustration of the understeer gradient formula that we have just derived on the previous page. What we see here is a diagram where the steering angle delta is plotted over the lateral acceleration. According to the formula, if the lateral acceleration is zero, the steering angle equals to the kinematic steering angle. The two lines drawn in this diagram are two examples of an understeering vehicle in blue and an oversteering vehicle in red. For the understeering vehicle, the understeer gradient k is positive and hence the line representing the relationship between delta and a lut is upward sloping, whereas for the oversteering vehicle, the understeer gradient is negative and hence the line is downward sloping. For the understeering vehicle, the point where the steering angle passes two times the kinematic steering angle for the first time is defined as a special point. 
and the corresponding lateral acceleration, which is given by the longitudinal velocity squared divided by r, yields a very particular velocity, which is called the characteristic velocity. Similarly, for the oversteering vehicle, the point where the steering angle passes the zero mark is defined as a particular lateral acceleration and the speed that corresponds to that lateral acceleration is defined as the critical velocity. The diagram we have just looked at clearly comes from our theoretical derivations for the linear bicycle model. In reality, such a diagram can also be obtained by performing vehicle experiments. And that's what's shown as an example in the second diagram. What you have to do to obtain such a diagram is obviously drive a vehicle in circles with different longitudinal speeds and different radiuses and record the lateral acceleration and the steady state steering angle. There's even an international standard called the ISO 4138, which describes in detail how to perform these experiments. From the experimental data, you obtain lines as the two examples here for an understeering vehicle and here for an oversteering vehicle. And generally what you observe is that there is a region where the lateral acceleration is small enough such that the relationship between the steering angle delta and the lateral acceleration is indeed almost linear. So this region can be used to experimentally determine the value of the understeer gradient. Moving out of this region, the tire nonlinearities kick in and the nice linear relationship is lost. Nonetheless, you can experimentally determine the value of the characteristic speed for the understeering vehicle, namely where the curve of the steering angle first passes through two times the kinematic value. And you can also determine experimentally the value of the critical speed for an oversteering vehicle, namely where the curve passes through the zero steering angle.